Uh, students, welcome back to the developmental biology class. In the last class, we were discussing about homeotic uh, genes in um, Drosophila. Um, I was telling you about uh, how, what is their role and how their expression is controlled by the gap genes and pair role genes. Um, so, today we continue that discussion. So, uh, to recap again, homeotic genes um, specify the, for example, uh, in the thoracic region, the, the three segments each one form um, one pair of legs. So, you have three pairs of legs and then the second um, thoracic segment forms in addition a pair of wings and that is specified by a specific uh, in a combination of uh, homeotic gene expression there. And in the next one does not form pair of wings, instead the homeotic genes expressed there specify for a structure called halters. They again exist in um, a pair and uh, they help in balancing uh, the flight. So, suppose if a homeotic gene that is uh, expressed there that specified halter is mutated, then the second, the third segment behaves more like the second segment and ends up making a pair of wings as shown here. So, the third thoracic segment behaves more like the second uh, thoracic segment and ends up making a pair of uh, wings as shown in this particular uh, for picture here. And the other important thing about uh, homeotic genes that I want to emphasize today um, is their uh, conservation among diverse group of organisms starting all the way from polychaetes to mammals, uh, you have uh, these genes conserved. And it is not that their sequence and functions are conserved, uh, what is really intriguing is collinear arrangement uh, of the order in which they are present on the chromosomes and the, bo uh, the body structures they specify in the anterior to posterior axis. Uh, for example, if you look at here, uh, so you have genes on a particular chromosome, uh, Hox 1 to Hox 13 arranged in this particular order, they are color coded. Um, so, you have them in a particular uh, arrangement and the genes in this uh, towards the phi prime end of the chromosome or in this diagram towards the left end is the one that uh, specifies the more anterior structures and progressively as you go towards the right end of the chromosome, so you have the structure specified more posteriorly. So, there is a collinearity in the arrangement of Hox genes on the chromosome and the body structures that they specify in the anterior to posterior. And the intriguing thing is this arrangement, the collinearity itself is conserved uh, across um, you know very diverse organisms. So, for, for example, the anterior genes in the fly uh, specify the anterior segments and the posterior to the posterior and exactly the same way it happens in uh, mammals as well. So, the, even the collinearity is uh, conserved. So, we do not fully understand why uh, this order and the body axis, the structures along the body axis are important, but uh, this is the level of conservation you see uh, among the Hox genes. So, now how are the Hox gene expression initiated? So, they are uh, uh, initiated by the role of uh, gap genes and pair role genes and they are uh, responsible for activating. For example, uh, gap genes hunchback and cripple, they are in the anterior region and they inhibit the expression of the posterior group of uh, Hox genes. For example, abdominal B and abdominal A are inhibited in the head and thorax uh, segments by hunchback and cripple. And for this, you need high level of hunchback. So, if you go posteriorly, when the hunchback level goes down to a certain level and that concentration of hunchback activates the expression of antennapedia, one of the anterior group uh, Hox gene. And um, such that uh, antennapedia is expressed only in para segment 4. So, this is how their initiation is um, uh, in a set. 
basically the genes are uh, gap genes and the pair rule genes determine the expression of uh, Hox genes. And their expression is not uh, you know fixed like antenopedia is expressed in para segment 4 uh, all through embryogenesis. So, it, it does not work that way instead it is dynamic. So, expression begins in one segment one para segment and it might extend uh, posteriorly and then it retracts back and so it dynamically changes during embryogenesis. And um, the other important aspect uh, is uh, the more anterior expressed Hox genes are usually uh, inhibited by the posterior uh, genes expressed posterior to a given Hox gene. So, such that um, when you mutate a posterior Hox gene, the anterior gene expression domain extends posteriorly. Fine. So, okay. So, now when initiation happens in this manner and it is dynamic. So, do I need the gap genes and pair rule genes all the time for the Hox genes to continue to be expressed? Um, so, that is not going to change happen because ga gap gene expression and pair rule gene expression is also going to change as the embryo uh, embryonic development progresses and they indeed would not be expressed later. So, therefore, the Hox genes need to be uh, their expression status need to be maintained um, so that the specific downstream genes responsible for the forming of a given organ are activated and therefore, the Hox gene expression needs to be maintained and that maintenance is usually done by through chromatin modification. So, the cro chromatin or, or region in which a given Hox gene is present is modified such that it either remains repressed so that it you do not need any factor to control inhibit its expression, it is permanently uh, you know set in, set in an inactive uh, state of chromatin and polycomb proteins do that. And if a given Hox gene needs to be kept active uh, permanently and that is done by trithorax protein. So, these two gene pro group of proteins are involved in chromatin modification to maintain the Hox gene expression pattern. So, now how do the Hox genes specify the specific organs? Um, whose formation they are ultimately responsible and that is uh, not directly done by them. They are more act more like the you know executive sitting in the uh, you know decision making or policy making room and then give instructions to the downstream uh, players. Okay. So, it is like CEO giving commands to managers and directors and vice presidents and then they go to the uh, floor you know factory floor level managers and give instructions to them and then the managers give instructions to the people who work in the floor who actually make a machine for example in a you know workshop. So, that is the kind of hierarchy that works in um, you know making an organ um, not just in fly in any organisms. So, Hox genes are these executive suit uh, genes. So, they are the master regulators. So, they therefore, we call them as homeotic selector genes. Uh, for example, in this particular uh, case where we are talking about a structure called Fritz Gopper, it is a tube that connects the trachea to the outside through this particular posterior segment. Uh, in this organ formation, we have better understanding of this uh, genetic hierarchy starting from the uh, decision making Hox uh, homeotic selector genes all the way to genes that actually alter the cell structure and um, function such that a specific organ is made. So, uh, to go into the details of this, this abdominal B, one of the Hox genes of uh, the posterior group gene, this is a transcription factor that activates the transcription of four other genes, uh, which are again transcription factors except this one, which is a paracrine factor, the other three are transcription factors. So, these are called the regulator genes, and these regulator group genes then activate 
the transcription of actually the uh, workers who are going to actually assemble the machine. And these are called the realizator genes because they realize that particular organ. So, they may they bring it to reality and that is why they are called realizator genes. And uh, for example, crumbs activated by EMS and uh, unpaired is uh, going to you know create the polarity of the cells. So, so that the, you know they have but, but like for example, in epithelial cells you have the apical basal polarity. So, that sort of a cell polarity is directly brought about by crumbs. And similarly, this rho GTPases we have learnt uh, earlier in a class that these GTPases are important for uh, morphogenesis. Uh, to recall a drosophila example, this is required for ventral furrow formation. So, this is involved in organization of cytoskeleton. So, therefore, the cell shape can change and as a result cell function will eventually change too. And then you have a series of cell adhesion molecules, categorines, they are again induced by these transcription factors and then you have the cell adhesion uh, property to be brought about. So, this is finally these properties of cell structure function have to be brought about by proteins that are directly involved in them and those proteins have to be expressed at the right place at the right proportions and that is determined by these regulator genes which are in, uh, in turn activated by the homeotic genes. So, this is how homeotic genes uh, also you know the called Hox genes in short uh, control the formation of organ identity uh, in Drosophila embryogenesis during embryogenesis. Alright, so now we are coming to the end of uh, this discussion on how the anterior posterior um, pattern is formed in the embryo. So, remember we started with a um, uh, symmetrical oocyte and then we saw in the oocyte itself we have the dorsal ventral polarity establishment starts in Drosophila. And then later we started focusing on the maternal effect genes, how they uh, set apart uh, you know make the embryo asymmetrical for example, bicoid is expressed only in the anterior and nanos only at the posterior ok. So, these are molecular asymmetries. So, the uniform cytoplasm now become asymmetric in terms of its components ok and that finally gets elaborated via the activities of downstream genes like gap genes, parole genes um, and segment polarity genes and then finally you have the Hox genes. And as a result of the uh, sequential action of these genes, now the embryo is patterned as shown in, um, this is only an example a set of proteins shown here, but you have more uh, molecules that are asymmetrically localized in, in a manner shown in this particular image here. So, here what you are actually seeing is left is the anterior and the right is the posterior of the embryo, dorsal and ventral. So, here you have uh, the distribution of different proteins uh, color coded here. So, the green then you have the red meaning this red protein uh, we do not need to worry about what exactly is this protein. Um, the focus here is the pattern and asymmetric localization. So, only in this narrow band of cells you have this expressed and similarly you have vertical uh, polarity as well. So, this is um, you have the anterior posterior shown in the vertical lines and then the dorsal ventral polarity shown in these horizontal lines this green, red and then uh, green again. So, so this actually forms uh, based on this uh, asymmetric expression of these proteins, we can actually pinpoint uh, the, uh, li like in a map if you give the longitude and the latitude uh, for a particular point on earth uh, only that point will have that particular longitude and latitude. So, the longitude and latitude in two axes they specify the uh, uh, the point uh, position of a given uh, location uh, in, in a geographical map. Th we, we call that as Cartesian coordinate diagram and that sort of a Cartesian, co um, Cartesian coordinate diagram 
sort of thing forms through this dorsal, ventral and anterior, posterior distribution of these molecules. And that is what gives a set of a, a unique combination of factors in every one of the cells in this, uh, um, in these two axes. And what is the consequence of that? That is uh, exemplified by how salivary gland is specified as you see in this diagram B. So, this uh, SCR gene activates in this, uh, when you look uh, anterior to posterior in this narrow band, dorsal to ventral is the region where the SCR activates the formation of salivary glands. But salivary gland does not form all through this dorsal ventral axis in this anterior posterior position, but it is only in this particular place because here you have high DPP which inhibits the activity of SCR in specifying salivary gland. So, similarly um, in, the in the ventral region dorsal, remember dorsal specifies the ventral fate. So, the dorsal inhibits uh, salivary gland formation here and therefore, salivary gland forms only in this specific place. So, this is how the specific location of each organ formation is determined by uh, in this uh, Cartesian coordinate system by the unique set of molecules that are expressed in, uh, in every group of cells. Okay. So, this is how um, anterior posterior axis formation. Uh, helps in organ specification in Drosophila. Okay. So, now uh, we sort of take a break in our discussion on animal development. So, we got an idea of uh, start, you know, we, we learnt about differential gene expression initially uh, as the major, uh, you know, underpinning for uh, bringing about uh, asymmetry and how a zygote becomes asymmetrically uh, developing embryo uh, forming organs at specific places. And then uh, we took the Drosophila example where we saw how the dorsal ventral asymmetry and anterior posterior asymmetry forms. So, this has already given us a good grounding on how animal body plan is set. So, now what we are going to do is we are going to go and from this background in this context we are going to look at another uh, group of multicellular organisms that became multicellular completely independently from the animals and we will see how there the body pattern uh, is established. Then after that we will come back to uh, continuing on early embryonic development in other uh, animals as well. So, so, the main thing is the, the main thing that we are going to focus when we learn about plant development is what are things that are unique about plants. Uh, I, I want to remind you that organisms be, you know evolved the ability of what we normally associate with plants at unicellular stage. Okay. So, the, the photosynthetic organism was not a mul multicellular thing. So, the branching happened before multicellularity. So, in that sense multicellularity evolved twice independently once in the animal kingdom and another one in the plant kingdom. So, therefore, there could be completely independent set of rules that could have uh, you know played a part you know like there need not be only one way of uh, setting up a multicellular uh, status. So, so uh, here what we are going to look at is uh, were there any unique uh, rules uh, in this multicellularity. Um, so, did plants evolve a different set of rules that governed formation of a multicellular structure. So, that is what uh, really interests us to uh, go forward in considering how plant development happens. Fascinating about plants first. So, unlike the animal cells, you know, we talked uh, extensively about gas relation uh, early on uh, while we were talking in the very first lecture about the amphibian life cycle. Uh, plants do not have the luxury of gas relation. So, there are no cell migrations. So, there is only one exception that we I will point out when we get to that particular one. So, 
without cells migrating you had to form all the organs okay so that's an a, a challenge that the plants have to handle uh, while forming a multicellular body and the second unique thing about plants is um in, in animals you have germ cells that undergo meiosis and they form haploid gametes okay so directly meiosis like reduction division end product is gamete but plants do not do that at the end of meiosis they form a set of haploid cells they are not right away gametes they could mitotically proliferate in haploid state and then later form uh, uh, egg and sperm okay so that is unique about them and that is um, one of the uh, you know the main differences between plants and animals and as a result of that that the meiosis does not result in gametes and instead it generates a set of cells that can mitotically proliferate plants actually exist in two different um, uh, you know stages in their life cycle okay so in one stage they are diploid and then when they undergo meiosis they produce a set of cells that are haploid so the diploid stage is called the sporophytic stage or sporophytes a diploid plant body is sporophyte because it is capable of generating spores the product the immediate product of meiosis are the spores okay so the, the meiosis produces spores not gametes and the spores are capable of undergoing mitotic divisions uh, extensive or only limited number or may not even do that it varies from species to species and they generate gametes because they have the ability to generate gametes they are called gametophytes so to summarize sporophytes are deployed plant uh, stage it is a multicellular organism capable of independent existence and it through meiosis generates what are called spores so they are sporophytes then those uh, haploid cells thus formed can undergo meiosis and make a multicellular structure that may be a, having an independent existence or it may in some cases be completely inside a attached to a sporophytic um, uh, you know plant and these are the gametophytes because they produce gametes so now um, let us uh, you know go ahead and look at these structures but before we go ahead there are some more differences that we need to look at uh, a, a thing that particularly fascinates me because I study germ cells is that plant cells do uh, plant zygote does not right away set apart the germ line when it undergoes cleavage and gastrulation and so on so they make lot of cells and then they make lot of different kinds of cells and germ cells are not one of those kinds so they don't set up our germ cells uh, during uh, early stage of development okay so in that sense any plant cell actually can become a germ cell if the situation warrants so so that is an interesting aspect of plants they do not make germ cells in early development then plants undergo extended morphogenesis you know if you cut off your uh, finger it is not going to come back your uh, rest of your hand is not going to develop a finger but that is not the case with plants you pluck a leaf the leaf grows you cut a branch another branch grows up so they can undergo morphogenesis throughout their existence it is not that morphogenesis happens only during embryonic development if you consider as a contrasting example if you take a human uh, development by the time you are born your development in the sense of morphogenesis is complete okay all the body structures are already formed and they only grow up later uh, new structures are not possible the, uh, I mean regeneration of lost structures is um, very limited capacity okay but that is not the case with plants they undergo morphogenesis um, throughout their existence and not only that they are capable of undergoing morphogenesis throughout 
they have tremendous uh, flexibility in development, we what we call as developmental plasticity. We will learn about developmental plasticity in another context, um, you know, uh, several lectures from now. But here what I am talking about is, for a given genotype, uh, plants are not like identical twins, okay. So, you can have identical genome and you can plant the identical seeds in two different locations or maybe even next to each other, but they are not going to form identical, you know, fully developed plant, you know, the branch pattern, leaf arrangement, where, uh, how many flowers, etc. are not going to be identical, okay. So, depending on the environment, they can change. Like for example, a plant, a seedling that grows adjacent to a wall might make branches away from the wall and uh, another seed, you know, its identical cousin planted in an open ground will, uh, you know, make branches all over, all around. So, you, you, you see different uh, body uh, structures, different um, arrangement of others, you know, parts depending on the environmental influences. So, that is what we call as the developmental plasticity. So, they have tremendous pla developmental plasticity, okay. And this point I highlighted even before starting this lecture, multicellularity evolved independently. So, therefore, plants, uh, studying plant development helps us to understand whether there are, uh, you know, completely different set of rules that govern plant development, okay, how cells interact among themselves in plants, do they differ from animals. So, so th these are all the reasons um, that really excites us to uh, learn about plant development. Okay, so I sort of introduced, um, you know, for some of you since you do not actively think about it all the time, a confusing thing that is meiosis does not generate gametes, what do you mean by sporophyte and gametophyte and gametophyte being a separate entity. Uh, it is not inside the gonad like egg and sperm are. So, therefore, we will get into that right away and get all the confusions uh, clarified uh, to start with. So, let us go step by step in this um, uh, cartoon. So, if you look at the left, you have a 2N organism like any adult. So, there is no confusion here, we have a diploid organism. And the diploid organism uh, has some cells that undergo meiosis, no big deal. In my body also germ cells undergo meiosis. So, you, you will think so and you would not find this hard. So, it is easy. So, this meiosis results in half the number of chromosomes. So, from 2N we came to 1N. Now, this 1N need not necessarily fuse with another 1N and in fertilization and give rise to the 2N organism. This is what happens in most of the animals and this is what you are familiar with. This is just one of the paths, this need not be the only path. So, you can have this 1N cell dividing, why not? The rules of mitosis does not stop, you know, it does not count the how many pairs of chromosomes are there, it only worries about what is the total number of chromosomes. So, the duplicated sister chromatids can come to the metaphase and divide into two cells. So, one N can make lot of one, one, one N cells through mitosis and that can create an one N organism like the two N organism. So, that is the haploid generation. So, this organism can be in a haploid generation and this could be extended or it could be short like path B. And this 1N organism at the when the conditions are favorable can generate the gametes that can fuse with another 1N in fertilization and give rise to 2N. And this 2N you always think it will undergo mitosis to form 2N organism and then only that can at, uh, you know, when it reaches sexual maturity will produce, my, you know, gametes through meiosis. It can directly like skipping the way you were thinking this, here the 2N can skip this generating the 2N organism and directly uh, undergo meiosis and make 1N. So, what I am trying to highlight here is that uh, just like how we are used to seeing this phase of existence at this stage or the diploid generation 
being the main generation, this is the more dominating thing. Like that, you can have the one n stage also. Okay, haploid generation. And to extend this argument further, in some organisms, this may be the dominant one and this may be short. So, these variations all exist in plants. <coughs> I am sure you will not need me to show an example for this being dominant. I will show you an example for a organism where this is um, independent, uh, individually self-sufficient uh, existing generation. So, that is in the next picture. So, this you have here a tree branch on which you have this lot of uh, moss plants growing and these are, believe me, these are haploid cells, this is a haploid generation. So, you know, uh, cells underwent uh, meiosis produced haploid cells which divided and formed this plant body, okay. So, this is an example of a gametophyte dominant plant, okay. So, now before we go any further into plant development, let us start with how to make the gametes and then we will go about gamete fusing and making embryo and then we will talk about how the body plan is set up or uh, body plan of the embryo is formed, okay. So, we start with gamete formation or gametogenesis and for that we need to understand the plant structures and the main uh, focus uh, in our plant development discussion in this lecture as well as in the uh, subsequent lectures uh, on plant development, our focus will be on flowering plants, all also known as angiosperm, okay. So, this is what we are going to focus. So, the angiosperm uh, gamete formation happens in a specialized organ, a beautiful organ called a flower, okay. So, let us learn about the structure of flower because this is the one that is going to make the eggs and the sperm, okay, um, to generate the next generation. So, if you look at the flowers, um, we will talk about the different kinds of sexuality in flowers later, but before we go there, we take one cartoon that has all the structures, okay, the male, female structures, everything in one flower. So, that is the kind of structure we are going to look at. So, in the flowers, all of you know what is a petal and then inside the petal, you have something called a filament. At the end of filament, there is a structure called anther. So, this is the male reproductive organ. And then you have another structure called uh, and this both together like the filament and anther both together you call it as a stamen. So, stamen is like the testis, okay. And then you have another structure called carpal which is like our ovary, okay, in uh, mammalian ovary. So, this has a stigma on the top. I will show you in a specific plant, therefore, you will appreciate these distinct structures very well and style and then you have the ovary in which you have the ovules, individual eggs, okay. And now, let us see how, how they form gametes. So, now if you take this anther and make a cross section, then you will have like this four. So, this is a cross section when it is cut and each one of these chamber like structures, we call them microsporangium because it makes cells called microspores and the cells inside them, multiples of them, they are called the microspores. So, we are going to ignore other structures around because the class is not focused on plant anatomy. We, our goal is to understand what gives rise to gametes, okay. So, that is our main focus. So, there we are going to only focus on, focus on the cells that we would normally like to call germ cells. So, the microspores are present in this microsporangium and these microspores are formed by, as I have already elaborated, uh, meiosis and therefore, they are one n cells. And these will undergo mitotic divisions and we are not going to get into all the details of how a microspore through mitosis gets here. But the final structure that they form, the gamete is called pollen, okay. So, we are going to uh, learn in detail in the next slide about wa what is the structure of a pollen cell, okay. So, this is the male gametophyte. So, in the microsporangium, you have microspores formed by meiosis and each of those microspores is capable of undergoing mitosis and generating 
what is called pollen and this pollen is the gametophyte, male gametophyte. And if you look at the female structure, so this has uh, a structure called megasporangium and the megasporangium unlike the microsporangium which had multiple microspores, um, microspores themselves come from what are called microspore mother cells, microspore mother cells undergo meiosis to make microspores and they in turn undergo mitosis and finally form pollen grain. So, here you do not have multiples of them, you will have one megaspore mother cell that will give rise to the gamete eventually. So, this uh, megaspore uh, mother cell um, you know formed by meiosis, so actually you end up making four cells um, as a result of meiosis, but these are not formed by equal cytokinesis unequal cytokinesis and meiosis ends up generating a large megaspore and three small megaspores and these are not going to do anything, they are going to degenerate and this one large megaspore is the one that will undergo three successive rounds of mitosis, end up making eight nuclei and these eight nuclei will be present in seven cells. So, we will learn that also in the next couple of slides later, how this uh, female gametophyte forms. So, megaspora, spora, spore mother cell mean megasporangium undergoes meiosis to generate four cells, but due to unequal cytokinesis will make one large megaspore and that megaspore after three rounds of mitotic division forms the female gametophyte ok. And now the male gametophyte female gametophyte fusion generates the embryo. So, this is the outline. So, let us get into the details of male gametophyte formation and the female gametophyte formation. So, this is the cross section I talked about. If you take anther of a typical angiosperm cell, uh, angiosperm uh, flower and if you take a cross section, you will see these four chambers and you can call them microsporangium or pollen sacs and there you are going to, uh, if you look enlarge and look at that, then you will see these somatic structures that uh, if you are very much interested, you can read and remember the labels, but all I want to uh, highlight is that there are lot of diploid cells, you know the sporophyte cells are around there and this is the one that is the, that is going to form the gametophyte. So, these are our germ cell equivalent and these are the microspore mother cells and these microspore mother cells undergo uh, division and when they do that, they could undergo two successive meiosis, ok. Meiosis 1 generating two cells and then they undergo um, each cell individually undergo cell division as shown here and form 4. So, this is how it happens in monocot successive type. Then here you have simultaneous type where one after the first division you have simultaneous spindle formation uh, which results in simultaneous division without any cytokinesis into uh, four uh, cells ok. So, this is what happens in the dicot. So, these are the two different ways by which the pollen mother cell or the microspore mother cell undergoes meiosis and generates microspores. And the microspores after mitotic divisions, they end up forming a structure called the pollen grain ok. So, pollen. So, th this is how the pollens look under scanning electron micrograph. Um, so, here you see the, you know, on the top portion, so this colored one. So, that is where the, the, these are the structures, um, you know, anther where you are going to have uh, the pollen grains. And if you take individual one and look enlarge and uh, take a cross section, this is what you find. So, let us focus on the, the business end of the structure that is this blue colored one. So, here a funny thing you see is a cell with its own nucleus and it is you know coming from a um, cell that underwent meiosis and therefore, it is one and nucleus, no big deal. But in its cytoplasm, it has another cell ok. So, that is the funny thing and that cell has its own nucleus. 
So, you have a cell within that you have another cell and this cell is called the generative cell. So, this is the one that is going to divide into two and form two sperm, okay, the gametes. So, this is still not gamete, it is a gamete of fight. So, this generative cell present within another cell which we call tube cell. Why am I calling tube cell will become very obvious when we go further uh, and learn about uh, how fertilization happens. So, until then do not worry about why is this called tube cell. So, you have a tube cell within which you have a generative cell and that is what is going to divide into two and form two sperm. Okay. And these are encapsulated in a structure called intin and this intin is produced by this uh, you know gametophyte um, stage. So, this is a gametophyte individually existing uh, male gametophyte, it is the haploid generation of the that particular plant species. So, this produces this intin, whereas the outer surface called exin is produced by uh, the sporophytic cells that were around like you know what we saw in the previous structure like these cells. So, the, these are sporophytic cells from the diploid organism, they have the 2 n nucleus. Okay. So, they form this outer structure. So, this if you are trying to think like our egg or sperm, uh, it is not purely germline derived, it has components coming from the diploid stage. So, the maternal component is there here. Okay. So, I am highlighting this because it becomes important for our discussion in a later topic. So, this is the way male gametophyte forms. So, now let us look at how the female gametophyte forms. So, this is uh, you know the top is the stigma and then this in this particular cartoon uh, this is shorter, but in some organisms style is a long filament like structure. And then inside the petals etcetera you, you will find this structure called the ovary and inside the ovary you have these ovules. So, these are the ones that are going to make the female gamete and they are attached to this uh, sporophyte wall via the structures called a placenta. Okay. So, uh, the later when uh, this is fertilized and it is going to really grow further, this ovary becomes the fruit or in pea plants this is the pod and inside you have multiple seeds. Okay. So, this gives you an orientation of um, what you normally see. If you take a fruit, the fruit is this structure. This structure transforms into fruit and this structure transforms into the seeds. Okay. So, now if you take one of them and look closely, there you find the unequal cytokinesis for during meiosis has generated this one big um, megaspore and these are going to degenerate. So, this is the one that, uh, that is going to undergo three rounds of mitosis, okay. three rounds 2 to 4 to 6 to 8, 8 nuclei it will form. And these are encapsulated in this sporophytic diploid cell structure which we call as integument. So, this um, you know ends a protective layer later when um, this is fertilized and becomes a seed, this is going to be the seed cover. Okay. So, this is going to form the seed cover and this micro pile is the opening that helps in fertilization. Okay. And this whole structure we call um, you know once it has uh, undergone the three mitotic divisions we call as the embryo sac. So, that is shown in the next slide. Yeah. So, once that one single megaspore the larger of the largest of the four uh, that undergoes the you know three mitotic divisions, it is going to form seven cells 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and this whole thing 7 cells and this big cell is going to have 2 nuclei. So, that accounts for, so by this we have accounted all the 8 nuclei as well as the uh, cells, um, you know 7 cells and 8 nuclei. So, out of the 3 cells that orient themselves near the micro pile, the one cell that is going to fuse with the sperm that is the egg cell. This is 
you know uh, surrounded by the two more cells called synergates. The synergates help in um, the pollen uh, coming here and fertilizing this properly. And opposite to this as a result it is called antipodal you have three more cells. So, their function is not clear or later they are going to degenerate. While these two nuclei and this whole cell is called endosperm and this is going to produce and store lot of um, lipids and proteins and carbohydrates required for the uh, next generation to develop. Okay. So, this is the nourishment produce, uh, providing structure for this particular cell. Okay. So, this is the structure of uh, the female game, uh, gamete and this whole structure with these 8 nuclei and 7 cells we call as the embryo sac. So, the female gametophyte is the embryo sac and male gametophyte is the pollen grain. So, now we are going to um, you know of course, your next question is how these two gametes fuse right. So, we are on our way to understand that and um, that happens by a process called pollination. So, pollination refers to the process of pollen grain from one flower coming and landing on the top of this female structure. The top of the female structure as I told you is the stigma. Okay. So, the pollen grain landing on the stigma and then it has to find its way to reach this micro pile, it has to come here and that process landing and then germination. So, the process is uh, process of the pollen grain being able to reach the uh, egg cell is the germination. So, landing and germination is what is uh, pollination. Okay. And before we go and understand the process of pollination, we need to uh, clarify potential confusions that will arise because different plants produce different kind of flowers. So, therefore, let us first understand the different kind of flowers that exist. Okay. So, the male gamete producing structure and the female gamete producing structure both can be on the same individual plant. Okay. So, why I am uh, emphasizing this? For example, if you are a girl, you are not producing the male gamete, you only produce female gamete. Okay. And if you are a boy, you produce only the male gamete, you do not produce the female gamete. So, this is what you are more used to. But in plants, this need not be the case, both the structure can be on the same body, okay, same individual and therefore, both being in the same house, that is what this word monaceous, okay, in one house, um, both may be there. And even in that, you can have um, two different varieties. Like you could have uh, as the cartoon that we first saw, both stamen that is the filament and uh, you know anther and the carpel. So, that is stigma style ovary, they both can be on the same flower, you know example is hibiscus you know shown here. So, this is the stigma I was talking about. See here you have the style really long uh, structure going all the way here. So, the ovary and ovules they are all inside you cannot see in this flower. Okay. Um, so, so, this is the stigma. So, the pollen grain has to land here and this has the filament and the anther on the same flower. Okay. So, this is a perfect flower having both structures on the same flower on a same plant. So, that is called a perfect flower. Then you have other thing that is one flower produces only the carpel and another one produces only the stamen, but both are present on the same plant and that is why it is still monaceous. And there are examples like that and one good example is maize. Okay. So, we will see that too. So, here you have that if you if you have seen maize or if you walk around somewhere outdoors and if you chance upon a corn field have a look at this structure. So, this, this is the stem. So, this is the you know petiole, this is the leaf and you see in that on the axle on the side you have this you know structure forming. So, this is the female structure and on top of the stem as you uh, as you see in this uh, picture on the right 
you have the tassel. So, this structure is called ear and this is called tassel. So, this is the male part. So, the male flower and the female are on the same plant. So, this says um, carpellate flower, this is the staminate flower as we saw in the definition here, staminate and carpellate. So, if these are possible, then the other one that is one plant being male plant, another plant being female plant, just like us, that also exists. They are called the diocese plants. A good example is the Parmira palm that is ubiquitous um, particularly in South India. Okay. So, I will show you that as well here. Yes. So, this is a, the you know tall palm tree that you see everywhere um, you know in many parts of India and uh, Southeast Asia and so on. And this one has seeds, this, uh, this produces the palm fruit and uh, this is the male plant, sorry the female plant producing the female uh, reproductive structures. Okay. And this is how the male plant uh, st reproductive structure uh, looks like. So, this has lot of flowers on it and these produce only pollen, they do not have ovary. So, you and this is the one the farmer wants because this is the one that is going to produce the fruits and this is the male. So, you need to have both although you are not interested in it, without this you are not going to have these fruits forming. Okay, the female flower. So, this is an example of diocese. Interestingly, this is not common among the, uh, the all palm species. For example, coconut trees are monaceous. So, they in the same plant you have both. Okay. Um, so, that is example for the diocese plant. So, we will stop here and then in the next lecture we will continue on the pollination and then how the same uh, pollen fertilizing the eggs in the same plant and therefore, genetic diversity generated is uh, reduced, limited, how is that avoided and then how um, you know the uh, embryo develops etcetera. So, we will continue that in the next slide, sorry in the next lecture.